It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, and, uh, and good morning, Speaker. This is a, a moment in history right here, right here today. Very exciting. My question is to the Premier. Not every Ontarian has an OHIP card. Migrant workers that help keep our agriculture sector going through backbreaking labour, out-of-status workers in the construction sector who face risks on the job, and refugees fleeing violence and conflicts around the world. Through you, Speaker, does the Premier think the uninsured should be eligible for urgent medical care? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and congratulations to the member from Hamilton Centre on your uh, victory and coming here to join us in the House. You know, absolutely. Uh, we as a government understand the valuable work that our immigrant workers play, which is why we continue to fund those, those services through OHEP-funded services. You know, the member opposite has on the NDP website today, right now, false information, Speaker, and I don't What's use that word lightly. They are suggesting to the general public that individuals who have, have come <coughs> here and ultimately not, uh, and have, have come to Ontario, are not going to get services in the province of Ontario. It is factually incorrect, Shame. and it continues Shame. to be on the website, even though Multiple sources, Response. including the Toronto Star, has told them that, in fact, that is not the case. Would the member opposite respectfully re return that, remove that false information from their website? Okay. Um, I'm going to caution the, the minister on her language. Supplementary question. Wow. Well, well Speaker, <laughs> this, this, this Minister of Health should be listening to the physicians across this province who are telling her what this is going to mean for their patients. On a very busy Friday, it was revealed that the government is eliminating the Physician and Hospital Services for Uninsured Persons program. This is going to make it harder for refugees, for unhoused people, and for those with mental health challenges to access urgent health care. That this government is making these cuts while redirecting public money out of public care and into the po private pockets of a few connected people makes this even more shocking. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Why did his government choose to eliminate this simple yet compassionate program? Minister of Health. Member opposite should know full well that this program was put in place when individuals could not travel in the province of Ontario. At the beginning of the pandemic, when we had limitations on individuals who needed to be able to return to their homes, to their home communities, that was removed. Because of that, Order. we put in a funding model that ensured that individuals who were in Ontario could get the, the medical coverage they needed. I want to reinforce, you know, we have 75 community health centers spread across Ontario that have funding models that ensure that they can provide necessary health services for individuals for any number of reasons do not have an up-to-date OHIP card. We have temporary foreign workers who have programs provided by the federal government to Response. ensure that they have health care funding in the province of Ontario. Again, Speaker, I would urge the member opposite to take down the misinformation because it is, it is seeding unnecessary fear in the people of Ontario, and it's wrong. For a second. Stop. Yeah, I'm going to again caution the member. It's it's a causing some concern on the other side of the house, but I don't believe that the minister said anything unparliamentary. Final supplementary, leader of the opposition. Uh, the answer is they're not. They are going to go ahead and end, end that program. That's what we're hearing now. And and I want to I want to try this out on you. Devastatingly cruel, a big mistake, a regressive decision, harmful and cruel unconscionable. Not my words, Speaker, but those of physicians across this province who are talking about this government's decision to eliminate this program. Speaker, the Premier seems to have no problem finding ways to help out people that he knows, his friends. 
But when it comes to helping Ontarians who are in need, he's willing to turn his back. So my question to the Premier again is, will he reverse his decision to end this program and finally put those in need ahead of his insider friends? Members, so please take their seats. Minister of Health, reply. Mr. Speaker, I will be as clear as I can, unlike the NDP news release that is spreading false information. There is no change. I'm going, I'm going to ask the, the minister to withdraw. I withdraw. Include her response. I would respectfully ask that the NDP take down a press release that is seeding fear unnecessarily in the province of Ontario. There is no change in the way that uninsured persons will receive care in the province of Ontario. The only change is how hospitals, community health and midwifery centres will be reimbursed for ensuring and providing that care. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, I'll tell you something else that Ontario needs. Ontario needs one and a half million new homes over 10 years to keep up with demand. The NDP has proposed many ideas. Yeah, we do. I ask the government side not to interrupt the Leader of the Opposition when she has the floor the way they just did. Please don't do it again. Restart the clock. The Leader of the Opposition has the floor. We need them. These folks aren't delivering them. The NDP has proposed many idea ideas to achieve this, such as updating zoning rules to allow more affordable missing middle housing, investing in hundreds of thousands of new affordable and non-market homes. The government has said no to every single solution we present. Instead, they focus their attention on carving up the green belt, a decision that will only help a few insiders while everybody else is being left behind. Speaker, the government's own budget shows that new housing starts are going down in Ontario instead of up. Does the Premier really think that his plan Question. is working? To apply the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, speaker, over the last two years, Housing starts have reached a level that this province hasn't seen in over 30 years. That's right. exactly. Last year, Speaker, rental housing was at an all-time high. We've never had more rental housing starts than we did last year. Fact. Speaker, the member can say all she wants, but the facts are right in answer. When we proposed to give a break to nonprofit housing, they voted against it. Shame. Shame. When Order. we decided to make it cheaper and easier to build more purpose-built rentals and provided those incentives, her party voted against it. Shame. Time and time and time, we present positive Response. opportunities to create better general density in neighbourhoods, more rental opportunities, more nonprofits. It's the NDP. That is the party of no. They are the ones. And we'll take a seat. The supplementary question. Speaker that's, Speaker, that's all a bit rich because last week's budget has no new funding to build new social housing or even to protect the ones that are already built. And the Premier's own Housing Affordability Task Force Order. said that a shortage of land was not the cause of the housing crisis. They said we need to make better use of land already available. The NDP supports this principle, but this Premier does not. He ignored his own task force and targeted prime farmland and the green belt for destruction. Now the budget shows that housing starts are going down instead of up. Speaker, to the Premier, will he admit that his housing policies are failing? Mr. Fairs and Housing. Somebody, You've got to be kidding me. You know, in, in Minister Breton Falvey's budgets, the number one and number two ask for municipalities. Number one, we need more supportive housing. $202 million we're adding to the homelessness prevention program. Number two, wraparound mental health and addiction services with those supportive housing units. We have delivered exactly what municipalities asked as their number one and their number two ask. It's going to be very interesting, though, Speaker, to see Order. the Leader of the Opposition and Ontario New Democrats support 
the number one and number two uh, requests I bet from 444 municipalities. The final supplementary. Speaker, this Premier and his government need to get out there and actually listen to Ontarians. Because I can tell you, their budget completely missed the moment. Completely missed the moment and failed Ontarians. Not only is the Premier targeting farmland and the green belt, but he's targeting tenants too. He trashed rent protect protections for tenants, he made evictions easier, and he's threatening rental replacement bylaws that are going to put existing affordable rental homes at risk. The Premier's policies have failed tenants, made them more vulnerable, at a time when people are really hurting out there. Speaker, my question is to the Premier again. Will he protect tenants by bringing back real rent control and invest meaningfully in affordable and non-market housing? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, I already talked about our, our historic levels of rental construction last year, but you know, she mentioned the word listen. Well, I'm, I've got a few quotes that I'd like her to listen to. Ah. Deputy Mayor Jennifer McKelvey from the City of Toronto, I want to thank Premier Doug Ford and Minister, Finance Minister Peter Bethenfalvey for committing $48 million in this budget for wraparound services for 2,000 vulnerable residents in Toronto supporting supportive housing. What else you got? <laughs> Mayor Bonnie Crombie Whoa. from the City of Mississauga, Order. Chair of OBCM. Ontario big city mayors have been calling on the province to address the mental health addictions and homelessness crisis we are experiencing in our communities. And today's announcement for over a half a billion dollars for mental health and addictions and an additional $202 million per year Response? for the next three years in homeless and prevention will have a big impact here, here. in the ability of our cities to provide residents with the support and the resources they need. That's who we're listening to. That's who we're listening to. Stop the clock. Members will please take their seats. <coughs> the House will come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Budgets should reflect uh, the needs of the people that were elected to serve. Uh, during budget consultations, we heard from Ontarians who presented solutions to the major issues facing Ontarians who are facing record evictions, uh, barriers in access to family doctors, or even access to an open emergency room in this province. People in Ontario are hurting. But there was no sense of urgency in Budget 2023. In fact, one editorial said, and I quote, if this budget were a Christmas present, it would be a three-pack of white socks, not entirely useless, but an exercise in going through the motions. <laughs> Why didn't this government listen to the people of this province? Because they presented solutions to our health care crisis, to a housing crisis, and yes, to a climate change crisis. And to apply, the Minister of Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you for the question. I, too, want to congratulate the member from Hamilton Centre and welcome her to the House. Mr. Speaker, you know, my great parliamentary assistants uh, from Oakville and Bruce Gray, Owen Sound, uh, crisscrossed uh, the province uh, to, to listen to people. I, too, we went around the province and we heard from the people of Ontario. And you know what they said? They said, yeah, times are tough. The price of everything's going up. Thank you for acting in the budget of 2022. And by the way, Mr. Speaker, what did the opposition do on that budget? They voted? No. Well, then we went to the fall economic statement where, where we continued the gas tax cut, increasing the minimum wage, lower taxes for the lowest income workers in this province, ODSP gains, you know, I could go on. Mr. Speaker, which way did the opposition vote? Yes or no? No. So you have an opportunity Response? now. Budget 2023, which continues a historic investment in the people of Ontario to build a strong Ontario. Which way are you going to vote? Yes or no? Vote. The supplementary question. 
Uh, budgets are about choices, uh, Mr. Speaker, and we are seeing record evictions up 22 per cent. Yet this government refuses, refuses to provide rent control. RNAO has said Budget 2023 won't address the health care staffing shortage. Wages are still capped at 1 per cent. You cannot recruit new nurses into a broken system. Municipalities were promised to be made whole by the minister after Bill 23 removed the development charges and compromises cities' abilities to actually produce housing in the province of Ontario. In fact, Budget 23 contains a $124 million cut. Education, school boards are facing millions in shortfalls with depleted reserves, and OSSCF notes that the entire budget change for the education sector comes from the federal child care money, mm. which leads to a general question about transparency question. in the budgeting of this government. But will you be amenable? Will, will this government be amenable to fixing this budget because we are focused on solutions on this side of the House? Mr. Finance. Speaker, uh, where to begin? Uh, first off, I'd like to just uh, highlight that the education budget went up by another $2.3 billion in this budget. Well, Mr. Speaker, as we wow. listen right across Ontario, you know what they asked for? They asked for health care, but this budget, which gets $4 billion from the federal government over the next three years, which is true, you know, we'll give you that. Do you know how much we're investing in the people of Ontario in health care? $15 billion over the next three years. This government. And you know what that $15 billion does? It goes to pay nurses. It goes to pay personal support workers, physicians, therapists, you name it. We are supporting our health care workers. In fact, we put in an additional $80 million over three years to expand our nursing education for 1,000 registered nurses, 500 registered practical nurses, and 150 nurse practitioner Aunts. seats. Please join us and vote for the budget and support our health care workers. The next question, the member for Whitby. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. To begin, congratulations to the Minister on the introduction of the budget that lays out that lays out our government's plan to build a strong Ontario economy. Under the leadership of Premier Ford and this minister, the province is on a steady path to meet any challenge that comes our way. However, Ontarians know that we're not immune from the effects of global economic uncertainty, high interest rates, and inflation. Right. Speaker, all these factors can adversely impact the ability of manufacturers to grow, innovate, and become more competitive while creating new jobs. Question. Speaker, can the minister please explain what steps our government is taking to create the right conditions for expansion in Ontario's manufacturing sector? Minister of Finance. Well, first off, uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the very hardworking and gentleman from Whitby. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, these are uncertain times, there's no question, and uh, we are working hard to build a more certain future for future generations by focusing on the economy and infrastructure and, and our workers in this province. And, you know, last week I talked about a road trip that we took around the province, and, you know, we, we made multiple stops around the province. And, you know, one of the stops that we should have made was in Brampton. Well, you know what is happening in Brampton, Mr. Speaker? We are supporting auto manufacturing in Brampton, which had left, which was leaving the province. 300,000 jobs, manufacturing jobs, leaving the province over the last decade and a half. Guess what, Mr. Speaker? They're coming back. They're coming back to Brampton, to Oshawa, to Oakville, to Windsor, right across this province. The supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that great response. It's encouraging to know that our government is continuing to support local communities by attracting key investments that project jobs. The clear, decisive, and targeted investments announced by our government will help contribute to the creation and retention of thousands of good, paying jobs. In contrast, to the previous Liberal government with its reckless policies and complete disregard for the manufacturing sector, our government is leading with a balanced and sound approach that will benefit individuals, families and our communities. 
Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how the proposed Ontario-made manufacturing investment tax credit will improve our province's competitive edge? Great question. Minister of Finance. Well, Mr. Speaker, just uh, just as was mentioned earlier, the uh, the mayor of, uh, of uh, Windsor is here today, and, and part of that road trip, Champion. we went. We, yeah, he's a champion. He's a good guy, too. Um, <laughs> you know, we did that road trip and we stopped in Windsor because, you know what, we're bringing back good jobs through Stellantis, building a, a battery manufacturing plant awesome. in that. We're building a new hospital there, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, we're yeah. building roads. In, <laughs> in, but here, here's the thing. Here's the Order. thing. The businesses that are risking their capital will benefit with the Ontario Made Manufacturing Investment Tax Credit. This will help literally hundreds and thousands of businesses businesses that support the supply chain, secondary and third uh, tertiary manufacturers who are investing their own capital to create jobs, to be, uh, create new opportunities for families. Response. And that's why we're investing in this tax credit if passed. It will help cities like Windsor, it will help the workers in Windsor, and it will help Ontario prosper. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Superior North. Thank you, Speaker. Preventative care keeps older Ontarians out of hospitals and emergency rooms. Currently, seniors can access an eye exam every 12 months, but under this government's new rules, they will have to wait 18 months to get an exam covered by OHIP. This is a move to push seniors into using privatized services that many seniors cannot afford, nor should they have to. To the Premier, why is this government jeopardizing seniors' health by reducing access to OHIP covered eye care. Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I am incredibly proud of the work that our team was able to do ratifying an agreement with the Ontario Association for Optometrists for the first time since 2011. Yeah, yeah. 98 per cent of Ontario optometrists. Order voted in support of this deal. Why? Why? Because they understood clinically, and we worked very closely with the Ontario Association of Optometrists, and I really have to thank them for their commitment to getting this deal done. They worked very closely to ensure that we were looking at all of the services where they needed to be expanded, which of course we have expanded in appropriate areas like access to glaucoma, and also saying where are those investments and where do those pieces need Response. to be? Is it a healthy 65-year-old who has no eye issues, or is it that young patient who has um, diabetes, that senior who has glaucoma? Thank you very much. And the supplementary question, the member for Nickelback. Thank you, Speaker. I think we all know that good vision has a huge impact on our quality of life. The move that has been done by this minister leads me to ask, what evidence, what body of evidence was used, uh, does the minister have to support her decision to reduce access to eye care for vulnerable seniors with deteriorating vision? What is the body of evidence that support the move that this government is doing? And the minister of health. The body of evidence is the Ontario Association of Optometrists, who are the experts in this field, ratifying this agreement by 98 per cent. Now, the new funding agreement will actually increase care for people with chronic diseases such as glaucoma and ocular complications due to diabetes. Why, Speaker? Because Ontario optom optometrists understand that that is where the focus needs to be, where people who have active and engaged issues have, have eye care that is immediate and there for them. This agreement does this, and I, again, I am very proud of the work that our team has done settling this. Thank you. The next question, the member for Cambridge. Hey, hey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. The film production industry has been a major success story in Cambridge, and we welcome the tremendous economic injection into our local economy from domestic and foreign film productions. Nearly $900,000 was brought in just last year. Wow. One production that has been filmed here since its first season is The Handmaid's Tale. 
uh, which became Cambridge's unofficial claim to fame on the small screen. While viewers greatly enjoy this show as it wraps up its final season, local businesses in my community greatly benefited from the production and the work completed here. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting the film industry in Ontario, especially in communities like mine with new film and, question. and cinema production opportunities? Great question. <laughs> Mr. of Tourism. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you bet I can. Um, <laughs> and that's a great question. And I also appreciate uh, the member recognizing what happens in, within his community when the film and television industry comes in, not for a visit, but to do their work, stay for a while, and the ripple effect is positive for everybody. So thank you for noticing. Uh, the film and television production industries continues to thrive. In, and I, some people might say to me, as they have before, thrive, how could they have thrived? Well, let me tell you. Uh, in 2022, it was the best year ever. Hard to believe. But that goes to show you what a great industry it is. It is thriving, as I said, and it has wonderful people driving the bus. Highest productions ever, ever. Uh, I don't like to say numbers, but I will Response. say it's over $3 billion back in the economy, 46,000 jobs. This is an industry, Mr. Speaker, that's moving forward aggressively. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Thank you to, to the minister for that response. Speaker, And it's positive that our government is committed to making these targeted investments in Ontario's growing film and television sector. But what, is there more that can be done to solidify Ontario's uh, position as a first-rate centre for film and television production? Besides enjoying annual growth of this industry and the benefits to our economy, the people of Ontario expect our government to ensure we have a permanent foundation for homegrown film and television industries. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on the outlook for the film and television industry in Ontario? Thank you. Mr. Tourism, Culture and Sport. Um, uh, again, Mr. Speaker, thank you for the question. Um, well, we, we're not as reliant on international productions as we used to be. It was up domestic film and television production. Production was up 25% last year. Confidence in Ontario was right. Yeah, go ahead. That's 25% uh, is a big deal. Uh, confidence isn't just within Ontario. It's from outside of Ontario as well. Uh, there is a very large, may I say massive, production studio being built, 1.2 million square feet in Markham, Ontario. <clears throat> it's being done by a gentleman who grew up in Canada who's a star in the film industry, Ryan Reynolds. His company is building this. So there's more than just a few people, Mr. Speaker, that has confidence in Ontario and what they're doing. On top of which, response. You betcha. Driving jobs, driving revenue, good paying careers for people down the road in this industry. Great opportunity for young people, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa, West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. Our schools are facing significant cuts to the supports our children need next year, yet this government's new budget continues to massively underspend on education. If the government had just kept up with inflation since 2018, they'd be spending $2.5 billion more on education, and that doesn't even take into account the additional supports our kids need because of the pandemic. Will the government finally invest in our children, reimburse school boards for their COVID expenses, and provide the stable and adequate funding our children need? Good question. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Thank the member opposite for the question. I am very proud to confirm that the budget increases funding in the publicly educated school system by $2.3 billion, of which $1.3 billion specifically in baseline education funding is up from the year prior, Mr. Speaker. This year, compared to last year, it's up $671 million. Every single year, we've increased funding. In fact, under the Premier's leadership, funding is up compared to the former Liberals by 27 per cent in the Ministry of Education. That is an investment in children. We've hired 8,000 more staff. We have 200 more principals. We have another 800 more teachers. Mr. Speaker, we just announced a $15 billion investment to build new schools after the systematic closure of schools under the former Liberals. We're going to continue to invest and ensure these kids get back on track. 
The only thing historic about this government's education funding, Speaker, is their inability to get the funding out the door. <laughs> Under this government, kids with accessibility needs are already not getting the support they need. And now the government is forcing thousands of kids with autism into school with no transition plan and no additional resources for schools, which means already inadequate supports are going to have to be stretched even further. How are we going to keep these kids safe? How are we going to help them succeed? Where is the plan? And where are the resources to make sure that every child can thrive in our schools? Minister of Education. I thank the member opposite for the question. We, of course, are very committed to all children, including those with special education needs with exceptionalities within our schools. It's why in the funding announced last year for this school year, we increased the special education budget by $92 million, in addition to the hiring of 7,000 education workers, which include EAs, which are so consequential to the life of those kids. Mr. Speaker, the special education budget this year is up to $3.2 billion. That is the highest levels it has ever been in our province's history. And I assured the member opposite for children with intellectual and developmental disability. We are working together across the ministry to ensure they have the supports, the resources, and the staff in place to succeed in our schools. The next question, the member for Beaches East York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A glorious morning, everyone, and welcome to the new member from Hamilton Centre. Housing is an issue that is top of mind for most Ontarians. For many, owning a home is completely out of reach, and finding a home to rent is also a struggle. There are simply not enough homes to go around and not enough that are affordable. Enter the government with their impressive, albeit lofty, goal build 1.5 million homes in the next 10 years. Last week, we received the 2023 Ontario budget. The government projects over 80,000 housing starts a year for the next three years. This is a substantial decrease from the forecast in last year's budget. And if we continue this way, we'll need to build almost 200,000 homes a year thereafter. This will be next to impossible, Mr. Speaker. Can the Premier explain to Ontarians how the government plans on achieving the goal of 1.5 homes in 10 years, based on the numbers we saw in the budget last week, and considering we are already behind schedule? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, Speaker. I want to thank the member for Beaches East York for her question. And as I said earlier in the House, uh, over the last two years, uh, we've seen uh, housing starts in Ontario the likes that we have not seen in over 30 years. In fact, on the rental side, as I said earlier, on the rental piece, highest uh, amount of starts in Ontario's history last year. You know, we, we need everyone, all three levels of government to work together. And I, I want to specifically talk about the member for Beaches East York because she repeatedly, uh, as a member of Toronto City Council, voted to exempt uh, development charges on affordable housing, here. supporting oh. uh, the Whoa, City of Toronto's here. open door affordable housing here. program. So I want her to take the same, uh, you know, same principles uh, from when she was at Toronto City Council uh, and apply it to response? support yeah, yeah. Uh, our I'm measures sure in more homes built last year because that's exactly what we need to do. We need to incent uh, non-profit housing. We need to incent more uh, rental opportunities. Thank you very much. Minister, will take a seat. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And to the member opposite, I am darn proud of my track record on building housing at Toronto City Council. We know people want to live in existing communities, in urban centres and vibrant neighbourhoods with access to infrastructure that need to enjoy a fruitful life. Schools, public transit, parks, hospitals, shops. We should focus on creative solutions, building up, not building out, not creating more sprawl. It can and should be done. Homes don't have to be built in the green belt. They don't have to be built on floodplains and in wetlands. They don't have to be built in areas where you need to access everything by car. Mr. Speaker, my question is, Will the government be focusing on building an existing community? Question. And if so, what are some of the solutions that they are exploring, and how will they do so quickly, efficiently, and sustainably? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Speaker, I, I think one of the one of the best initiatives the government's put forward was on Thursday in Minister Bethan Palby's budget. Yeah. Where 
where we provided an additional $202 million to Ontario's 444 municipalities, including the City of Toronto. I read Deputy Mayor McKelvey's glowing uh, support she for uh, the budget and the initiatives we put in under the Homelessness Prevention Program, and also the wraparound services uh, for supportive housing that's in the budget for mental health and addictions. I also, because I know that she's a, a big advocate for housing, I'm glad that she uh, has indicated she'll continue to support our government's policies on non profit but you know the Ontario Alliance to end homelessness is pleased to see this significant investment in homelessness services from the government of Ontario this is a much needed increase in funding to help address Response. the homelessness crisis affecting municipalities throughout the province again uh, to the member I hope she continues to support our budget and support those initiatives I to help prevent thank you the next question the member for Brampton North Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Red Tape Production. Red tape gets in the way of businesses and is a waste of time, energy, and money. Unnecessary and outdated regulations implemented by the previous Liberal government, backed by the NDP, led to frustrations, delays, and compromise Ontario's competitive economic advantage over other jurisdictions. Under the leadership of the Premier and this Minister, our government is following through on our promise to tackle the inconvenience and hardship of pointless fees, complicated paperwork, and duplicative processes. While significant success has been achieved to make life easier through the Less Red Tape, Stronger Ontario Act, more work needs to be done. Speaker, can the Minister please explain what positive impacts the people of our province can expect to see as a result of this legislation? Minister, Red Tape Production. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the hardworking member for Brampton North for the important question, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we know under the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, the province was drowning under red tape. Of course, we know that businesses were fleeing our province, and families were having a hard time making ends meet, Mr. Speaker. Since 2018, reducing red tape has been one of the top priority for this government, and we've been working hard. We've introduced nine different bills to help Ontarians when it comes to unnecessary red tape burden, Mr. Speaker. What all of that means, Mr. Speaker, it means saving businesses and individuals over half a billion dollars, Mr. Speaker, in annual cost. Of course, with our most recent bill, Bill 46, Less Red Tape, Stronger Ontario Act, Response. again, includes a number of meaningful, impactful legislative and regulatory changes to boost our economic growth and modernize our government process. And we will continue that hard work, Mr. Speaker. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. We know the Liberals and the NDP have never seen a regulation they didn't want to duplicate or a tax they didn't want to double. The people of this province expect our government to find solutions that drive our economy forward, strengthen the resiliency of our local supply chains, and make government programs and services accessible and easy to understand. People and businesses in my riding and right across the province are best placed to help our government identify and eliminate outdated regulations and burdensome red tape. A focused and collaborative approach will ensure our continued economic success. Their knowledge and expertise will pinpoint unnecessary rules that do not serve a purpose and those that could be improved. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government will engage with Ontarians to identify how best to remove regulatory Question. barriers? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my colleague for that question again. One of my priority as a minister of red tape reduction, and I know our government under the leadership of our premier, Mr. Speaker, is to hear from as many as possible when it comes to as many businesses and individuals as possible, Mr. Speaker, and to hear their first-hand experience and learn from that, Mr. Speaker. And last week, I had an opportunity to meet with another consultation group from the retail council sector, Mr. Speaker, which was very productive. And I can tell you that their insight and the recommendations are what helps inform our red tape build. And I am proud to say that my team and I are already working on our next red tape wow. bill, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to engage with all Ontarians to generate new ideas on how we can continue to remove unnecessary red tape and continue to build on the tremendous success Response. we've had so far. Mr. Speaker, the people of this province 
deserve nothing less. Here, here, here. Next question. The member for Toronto Centre. Uh, thank you, Speaker. In 2019, Nicole's landlord filed for a personal use eviction. She later learned that this was misrepresentation. Today, Nicole's still waiting for an LTB hearing after moving into a new apartment that costs her now twice as much. LTB's own data shows that landlords are being fast-tracked for hearings over tenants. Can the Premier explain why he is making tenants wait so long for access to justice? Thank you. The Attorney General. And thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, you know, this really starts with, with the Liberals letting a system crumble and the NDP standing by while it happens. Mr. Speaker, as we brought forward significant resources, a record number of adjudicators, we, we during COVID, protected tenants by putting a, a pause on evictions. But when we brought forward investments for recruitment, the NDP voted against it. Oh. And when we brought forward investments for back office support, in the millions of dollars, the NDP voted no. against it, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Don't take and when we brought order. forward a, about almost $14 million, Mr. Speaker, to help with accelerating the hearings and the, and the systems, the NDP voted against okay, it, Mr. Speaker. Okay, what's going on? Now, we've here. made significant investments in the back end of the system, Mr. Speaker, because the Liberals had let it crumble Response? and the NDP stood by. I'd be pleased to talk about those in the supplementary. <laughs> The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Inadequate funding and flawed budgets isn't anything to brag about. After waiting three years, Speaker, my St. James Town constituents received an LTP ruling that ordered them to repay their landlords hundreds of thousands of dollars, reversing a prior rent reduction. If they can't pay and repay in 16 days, these new rental arrears may lead to evictions. They had to wait over three years for a hearing. They just got their ruling. Now they have 16 days to pay. Why is it agreeable to this Premier that the tenants have to wait so long for access to justice? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it's worth noting that, that the independent tribunal does strike a balance between protecting the landlords and the tenants' rights and, and sets its own docket accordingly, Mr. Speaker. But instead of the performative questions from the NDP, we're actually taking action and we're getting the job done, Mr. Speaker. We've invested $28 million in a, in a new system. It's a huge improvement, which we learned about and adopted from the NDP in British Columbia, Mr. Speaker. It's a phenomenal system. It came online at, at Christmas, uh, fully online at Christmas, and we have 60,000 individuals that have used it so far to navigate the system. Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud of the work that we're doing. We have more work to do. I look forward to the NDP supporting us at some point for something to help move us forward. The next question, the member for Cambridge. Hey! This time, my question is for the Minister of Economic Development job creation and trade. For years, the previous Liberal government sent hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs out of the province, including my riding of Cambridge. But they were also responsible for sending droves of IT jobs south of the border, leaving Ontario unprepared for the industries and jobs of the future. That's why we have taken action to rebuild the province's advanced manufacturing IT sector jobs all while growing the economy and creating these great jobs. Speaker, in a competitive sector that employs hundreds of thousands of workers, will the minister please explain how our government is attracting new investments and ensuring Ontario is open for business? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, just this morning, uh, we welcomed a $40 million investment from ViewReel. This is a made in Ontario startup in the Waterloo region. ViewReel has become a leader in the development and manufacturing of micro LED displays and sensors. They're used in devices in aerospace, automotive, and med tech. This investment with a $2 million support from the province will boost local manufacturing and strengthen clean tech innovation while creating 75 new good-paying jobs in the process. Speaker, this is how we're bringing new life to local manufacturing, and this is how we are building Ontario. 
Supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, for your answer. It's great to hear the government is focusing on provinces' advanced manufacturing and IT sectors and attracting significant investment to the project. That's right. And the province, including homegrown startups. It's clear that these types of investments are only possible because Ontario has created the right conditions for companies to grow and thrive. Speaker, with today's announcement from ViewReel, can the minister please elaborate on what conditions these are and explain why companies are choosing my riding of Cambridge and Ontario? Minister of Economic Development. Speaker, from lowering the cost of doing business by eight billion dollars, yes, eight billion dollars annually, to putting Ontario on the map as the second largest tech cluster in North America, with the Waterloo region accounting for a significant portion from that cluster, we are doing everything it takes to make Ontario the most competitive place to invest and grow. We have 26,000 tech companies, over 400,000 tech employees, 65,000 STEM grads every year, all part of a world-class innovation ecosystem. That's our competitive edge. That's the proof that we're creating the conditions for companies like ViewReel to succeed, and that's why companies continue to land Spons. here in Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, Speaker, ferry workers in Kingston are in a manufactured staffing crisis. Instead of raising these ferry workers' wages to competitive levels, the ministry has decided to pay an out-of-province temporary staffing agency two to three times more than what these unionized MTO ferry workers earn. Some of the workers are in the public gallery, Speaker, today, and their question is to the Premier. Will the Conservative government finally stop paying scab labour to do their jobs? Will they respect their collective agreement and repeal Bill 124 so that workers can get back to work with fair pay and competitive wages? On Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, and I thank you. I thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, ferries are an integral part of Ontario's transportation network, and I know that. Communities across the province rely on this essential mode of transportation for them to get to and from their homes and for uh, first responders as well. Mr. Speaker, Ontario is facing a historic shortage of workers that impact sectors across the board, including an industry-wide shortage of licensed seafarers that has affected ferry operations in the province. Mr. Speaker, in our budget, we announced funding for 20 new staff for our ferries. And in response to this industry-wide shortage of seafarers, Mr. Speaker, my ministry is working with the Ministry of Colleges and Universities so that we can offer more training programs to get more workers in the, in the industry. Mr. Speaker, this is not just a, pro a problem that is facing Ontario. It is a, pro a problem across the country, and that's why at my re most recent federal, provincial, territorial ministers meeting, I had the opportunity to discuss this with my colleagues from across the country Spons. so that we can make sure that we're addressing it so that we can get ferries operating on a consistent basis. Thank you. The supplementary question. The Speaker, the minister has money to pay people to cross picket lines, but not to pay the workers who do that work. Right. These <laughs> Speaker, the ferry passengers have experienced cancellation and delays of up to 12 hours on this vital transportation route, and worse still, the understaffing situation is a health and safety issue. There was a dangerous incident on the Wolf Island ferry just last month. These workers deserve to have safe working conditions, and the passengers deserve to feel secure, knowing that there are well-trained, experienced staff to ensure they're safe during their commutes. My question, Speaker, will the Conservative government stop the service disruptions and reductions caused by deliberate ministry understaffing and invest in permanent MTO ferry workers who keep our ferries safe and on time? Good question. The Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, let me be clear. Our government will never compromise when it comes to the safety of our traveling public. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, as per Transport Canada regulations, all ferries must be staffed with qualified and properly trained workers. And our goal is to make sure that all ferries are safely operational as soon as possible, and that's why we're working so diligently towards it. Mr. Speaker, we have new ferries coming on board. The new Wolf Islander 4 and the Amherst Islander 2 ferries will be in service as soon as possible. And as I said, our government is committed to working across the country 
with our, our partners, but also within government, with the Ministry of Colleges and Universities, to make sure that we have training programs in place so that we can have workers operating our ferries as soon as possible. Next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Atacokan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Many veterinary practices across Ontario are struggling to meet the growing demand for animal health care services, particularly in rural, remote, and Indigenous communities across the North. As MPP for the Great Riding of Thunder Bay, Atacokan, I have consistently advocated for a veterinary medicine program, program at Lakehead University in Thunder Bay. Lakehead University is a leading post-secondary educational institution that is forward-looking and is well positioned to educate more veterinary practices, practitioners sorry, to help address this pressing need throughout our, our province. Speaker, can the minister please explain when a veterinary pr medicine program will be implemented in Thunder Bay? Reply, the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Mr. Speaker, and the member from Thunder Bay, Atacokan, has been relentless in his advocacy for this initiative, and I'm happy to say that we are bringing vet education to your riding. Yeah. Yeah. Speaker, I am always excited to stand up and talk about the important work that my ministry is doing to address the most pressing needs and support economic growth across this province. Budget 2023 has a ton of great investments for the post-secondary sector, such as 100 new undergraduate medical seats and funding to support their clinical education. But our university speaker, they don't just educate the human doctors of the future. We also train the amazing pet and farm animal doctors our province desperately needs. I'm thrilled to say that as part of Budget 2023, our government announced funding for a new and long-awaited Doctor of Veterinary Medicine program collaboration between Lakehead University and the University of Guelph. Nice. This Response. joint veterinary program, which will focus on an integration of human, animal, and environmental health, will address the shortage of veterinarians in the province by creating an additional 80 new spots for students. And the supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister. That is indeed great news. I am thankful that our government recognizes the agri-food opportunity and economy of the North and highlighted in the commitment made in our budget last week. I want to thank the Ministers of Colleges and Universities and the Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs for ensuring the expansion of, expansion of vet services in the North, particularly large animal vet services. This is being described by my community industry leaders as a game changer. We know that across the north, vet services are spread thin while responding to vast geographical areas. A significant portion of vets, vet, veterinarians operate practices which are small businesses and have their own economic impacts. The people of Ontario are interested to know how this new veterinary medicine program will work to make a real difference in the post-secondary sector. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on this new program, along with the information about the overall Question. benefits provided for Northern Ontario? Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Over the coming years, the Doctor of Veterinary Medicine program will begin training cohorts of the next generation of veterinarians in Ontario. As I said before, this new funding will bring 80 new VMB students to this collaboration, helping more students get the training and educating, education they need for rewarding careers while supporting the needs of rural and northern communities. Veterinary medicine contributes well over a billion dollars per year to Ontario's economy and supports over 7,000 jobs. That's right, Speaker, 7,000 jobs. Through the addition of this program, we will support the veterinary medicine sector across the province while supporting the local economy in the communities across Ontario. This also gives students greater choice in where to study helps develop a skilled workforce, and will support the health of animals everywhere. Speaker, Ontario benefits when Ontario's post-secondary institutions give students the skills Response. they need to enter the workforce, ready to take on the jobs of today and tomorrow. And as always, through hard work and a focused approach, we get it done for the people of Ontario and animal lovers everywhere. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Hamilton West and Pastor Dundas. Question for the Premier. Uh, another inspection in a for-profit long-term care home has exposed terrible living conditions for our seniors, this time at Black Adar Continuing Care in my riding, managed by Extended Care. We heard from the daughter of a resident who was distraught with the undignified conditions her mother is living in, including numerous and extended power outages. Under this government, 
5,400 seniors died in long-term care during COVID, and a vast majority of these deaths were in for-profit care. Have you learned nothing from this tragedy? Why is this government giving these same for-profit operators multi-decade licenses instead of correcting these substandard care issues through enforcement? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the, uh, the question from the honourable member. Uh, uh, of course, there was an inspection that was uh, was done at the uh, at the home, and the home itself has uh, uh, been requested, not requested, ordered to fix the uh, generator problem by uh, June 30th, uh, or face administrative monetary penalties. Uh, speaker, as you know, of course, the the member opposite did vote against the increase in inspectors. We have the highest inspector to home ratio. Uh, in North America now, something that, of course, they voted against. The member opposite, of course, Order. remember that uh, uh, she uh, specifically voted against uh, the new homes that are coming yep. to her riding. Absolutely. The member also voted Order. against the additional 27,000 uh, uh, health care workers for long-term care and the over $60 million worth of funding for the members riding to increase uh, uh, the level of care. And, of course, the Minister of Colleges and Universities is helping us uh, attain Response. that 27,000 additional health care workers. Uh, Speaker, so uh, uh, look, I'm, I'm glad to hear that the member opposite actually supports some of the initiatives that we've done, especially when it comes to inspection. The supplementary question, the member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And back to the Premier. The problems at Black Adder is continuing care centre, which is managed by extended care, are consistent. It's an obviously pattern. The recent power outage wasn't an isolated incident. It happened at this home three times in two years. Three days after this news report from the Globe and Mail, the Hamilton Spectator reported that internal documents showed, listen to this, that long-term care home had dirt, mold, and leaks in their home. Extended care saying, not my fault, not my responsibility, is unacceptable. Long-term care operators need to be held accountable. Speaker, through you, when will the Premier and his minister stop protecting their corporate, profit-driven, long-term care buddies, protect seniors living in long-term care homes, where 5,400 of our moms, our dads, our aunts, our uncles, brothers and sisters have died in long-term care? Thank you. Mr. Long-Term Care. As I uh, just said, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have, uh, of course, hired uh, double the amount of inspections that are done in our long-term care homes. We have the highest inspector-to-home ratio in North America. That member voted against that uh, investment. That member has also voted against the over $61 million worth of staffing improvement in his riding. That's a nation, North American order. Four hours of care in our long-term care homes, Mr. Speaker. This is the exact same member who last week suggested that those health care workers working in for-profit long-term care homes cared less about the seniors that they were caring for, Mr. Speaker. Order. And as a result, Order. Mr. Speaker, this Order. gentleman here across the aisle suggests that's why he can't vote for all of the initiatives that Order. we're doing to improve care across the province of Ontario. Not something that they did when they held Spons. the balance of power. In fact, they completely ignored long-term care. Here's the good news, Mr. Speaker. Because of the investments in the budget, we're continuing to improve long-term care. And he'll Order. 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 Member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. It's always an education to hear from this minister, and I appreciate his environmental knowledge and expertise. Under the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, the people of Ontario heard lots of talk and promises about protecting ecologically sensitive lands. In contrast, our government has demonstrated our commitment to environmental conservation by making significant investments and getting it done. There is never a more important time than the present to continue to invest in initiatives that will conserve, restore and manage natural resources, including forests, wetlands and grasslands. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is preserving Ontario's natural environmental heritage? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Park. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, thank you to the member from Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston, such a strong advocate for the outdoors and our environment. 
Uh, the member's right, Speaker. You'll hear a lot from members opposite. Uh, opposite. They'll oppose a couple trees that would take 28,000 cars off the road with one of the largest, the largest public transit expansion in Canada's history that this government under this premier is making. They'll be against building more homes, Speaker, but they have no solutions. Uh, Speaker, that's why I'm pleased to say that thanks to this finance minister, this premier in the budget, we're investing more than 14 million more in the Greenlands Conservation Partnership Program. This speaker is a solution to protecting more in the province of Ontario and represents a 40% increase in funding, which will be used to secure ecologically important Response. land and conserve Ontario's natural beauty. Speaker, you can't spell conservative without the word conserve, and I'm pleased to stand here today to tell you that we're getting it done for the people. Of Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. It is important for the people of Ontario to know that our government is committed in both words and actions to expanding protection for Ontario's lands and waters for the good of both people and nature. Our natural areas support our local communities and provide habitat for species. Therefore, continued investment and support by our government is critically important. The people of Ontario expect that our government will continue to protect Ontario's rich biodiversity. Speaker, can the minister please confirm how these investments will help build Ontario for all of us? Minister of the Environment. Speaker, yes, I can. You know, uh, Speaker, I heard a member opposite say cringy, and it's that member who said that that's presided over sewage spills in her own community and, and proposed no solutions to that. But this government is getting it done. We hear a lot about pointing fingers at problems with no solutions from the members opposite. Well, solution to conserve more land is to invest in the Greenlands Conservation Partnership Program. It's protected over 400,000 acres of land and is the single largest provincial fund in this province's history to support private land securement. Speaker, that's the equivalent of over 300,000 football fields of protection under this Premier, this government. That's real action. That's real result. Mr. Speaker, the previous Spons? government talked a lot about it, but we never saw these sorts of funds, these envelopes to conserve and protect more. It's under the leadership of this Premier, this government, that they're going to work with partners to conserve. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning.